Instead of asking, Pastor, why can't I drink or be drunk? The more important question is this. What is so painful about sober life that I feel like I have to escape reality and sober life through a chemical portal that allows me to escape the realities of the day? What's good, everybody? It's the weekend, and I'm so grateful that you decided to join us this Friday night for the weekend exhale with BOL. This Friday, we're spending a little time in the playbook. Now, those who ever watch sports, you'll know that the coach has what he calls a playbook that has a script for the team's victory. And the good news for you and me tonight is that we have a coach in Jesus Christ and he's given us a playbook in the word of God. It is the script that guides us. It directs us. It leads us in the path of victory and allows us to be able to maneuver throughout the attacks of the enemy. And so tonight, we're going to be getting into something heavy. So there are times where I get emailed and text a lot of different questions about a lot of different subjects. But one of the questions I'm asked the most is, Pastor what does the Bible actually teach about alcohol or drinking? So I need you to know, listen, that the playbook has some answers for us to consider and weigh as we look to fashion our lives in harmony with God. So tonight as we get into it, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we ask that your Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us into all truths. So Lord, may we put your word above opinions, above the trends of culture, against just the imaginations of the heart. Would you speak to us in a very clear and powerful fashion, we pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So again, we're talking tonight about what the Bible has to say about alcohol and drinking. Now, let me just kind of lay a, a macro idea out for your consideration. And it's simply this, that when, it look, when you look at the scriptures, especially certain things, what are the things I need you to be mindful of? is that the Bible is, in many cases, descriptive, not necessarily prescriptive. And what I mean when I say that is that there are times where the Bible is simply describing what was a part of the culture in a said time, not necessarily prescribing a particular way of life. So what I mean when I say that is one of the things that the Bible describes as a part of ancient culture was polygamy. That was one of the practices of the time. The Bible describes that as being a practice, but the Bible doesn't prescribe that as the way we ought to go about marriage and relationships. The Bible describes the fact that slavery or indentured servitude was something that was practiced at the time, but it wasn't necessarily prescribed as God's way or God's ideal. And one of the things that as we talk about alcohol or drinking specifically, one of the things that's clear is that in, 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 in a first century uh, Palestinian culture, that alcohol or drinking was simply a part of the fabric of the culture, but it was not necessarily God's prescribed way. All right, so one of the things we wanna be clear is that the Bible does not just outright condemn or prohibit the practice of drinking. In fact, you know, it's hard to get away from. One of the things that Jesus did, his very first miracle, at the wedding of Cana in John chapter two is that he turned water into wine. In fact, there are some Bible verses that point to the fact that there was, a, there was the use of wine or drinking that was a part of the believer's economy. In fact, look at 1 Timothy chapter five and verse 23. 1 Timothy chapter five and verse 23, but I wanna just make sure that you have some clarity. 1 Timothy chapter five, and we're going to look together at verse 23 so that in when you look at the closing chapters of Timothy, he just begins to give a number of general admonitions about not just godliness, but for life and living to his son in the ministry, Timothy. So one of the things he says to Timothy 
is no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the stomach's sake for your treatment of frequent infirmities. So one of the things that you see even in ancient times is that a little wine, a little wine actually had some medicinal value or some medicinal purposes. Now, again, I know that's really not why most of us look at it. It's not necessarily to kind of settle the stomach. There are other things that we have for that. In fact, when you look over at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8, when you look at the counsel or the qualifications of a deacon, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8, check it out with me today. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8, the Bible says, Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money. So like even the Bible really talks about, even as it relates to a deacon, that a, a deacon ought to have a very uh, self-controlled disposition. And even the Bible doesn't just completely say a deacon should not have any wine, but the Bible says that they should not have much wine. In fact, it's not even talking so much to volume, but it's actually speaking so much more to frequency so that even those who will be leaders in the church, that their participation would be very, very infrequent. And even when it's done, it would be done in extreme volumes of moderation. All right. So one of the things I want to just really ex explain is that what you want to avoid doing is taking one or two verses like this and building a doctrine or belief around it so much so to suggest that, man, the Bible actually promotes the use of alcohol as a part of the believer's diet and the way for us to live and move forward in our faith. Because I need you to know when you take a little snippet here, a little snippet there, that's how some come to the conclusion that it was OK to own slaves or that it's OK to have several wives. It's when you take one or two texts that simply describe what was happening in the culture and use it as a means of prescribing the believer's way of living. Oftentimes we come to faulty conclusions. So right now I want us to get into the word. and I want to begin to teach us some principles from the word. All right. So one of the things I want to say, let's go with me over to first Corinthians chapter 10, first Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 23. There is a principle I want you to digest because there are a number of things that the Bible doesn't necessarily condemn or prohibit, but it doesn't mean that we should necessarily participate. First Corinthians chapter 10. And I want us to look together at verse number 23 and 24. All right. The Apostle Paul gives a principle. He lays out a whole number of moral issues and things that the church should or should not do. But he says this, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. So there's a principle at work that just because the Bible does not give a direct prohibition, because there's not a thou shall not. One of the things the Apostle Paul says is I exercise wisdom and discernment. So he said, even though this may not necessarily be outlawed, he says I, it may not necessarily be helpful. It might not necessarily be condemned, but it does not edify. So as a believer, there is a different standard. So I'm not just walking around looking for the thou shall not. As a believer, I don't live my life just looking for those areas where God gives a prohibition and then I live in the margins. No, I live according to a higher standard. I have to ask myself, does this help or does this edify? Does it strengthen? Does it make me whole? Does it add value and prosperity to my life? There's a higher standard so that even as you have the conversation about alcohol or drinking, you need to ask, is this helpful? And then number two, does this particular practice edify? Does it cause me to prosper? Does it push me forward in divine intents and godly objectives? And if that answer is no, you might need to make sure that you adjust your thinking and your practice. All right. So one of the things I want you to be clear on is that even though the word of God may not necessarily condemn outright Man, the complete practice of drinking, 
one of the things that the Bible does condemn directly is the practice of drunkenness. All right, so let's go to the word. Let's go here to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to look together at verses 9 and 10. Let's look here in the word together. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I want you to see this in verses 9 and 10. All right, let's look at it together. So the Bible says this, all right? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, for neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit, the Bible says, the kingdom of God. So one of the things that the Bible actually makes clear, it gives a litany of things that will not inherit God's eternal kingdom, and those who practice drunkenness are included in that list. Let's go over here to Romans chapter 13, the book of Romans chapter 13, and we're going to look together here at verse number 13. Romans chapter 13 and verse 13. Let's look at it here in the scripture. Romans 13 and verse number 13. So the Bible says, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and in lust, not in strife or in envy. So again, the word of God is kind of laying it out. So again, when we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, one of the things that happens is drunkenness, it actually threatens our salvation. But here, what drunkenness does is it threatens our, our witness, right? So the Bible is making clear that we don't walk in the way of the former life, with drunkenness and revelry and lewdness and lust, but our walk now ought to reflect our new experience of a sober-minded, joyful believer that finds their high in Jesus Christ. So let's go a little further. Galatians chapter 5. Let's go to the book of Galatians chapter 5 and look at how the Bible describes the practice of drunkenness. Galatians chapter 5. And let's look at it here together. Galatians chapter 5, looking together at verses 19 through 21. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. So the Bible says, now the works of the flesh are evident. This is the works of the flesh, the evidence, the proof of the flesh, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So again, we find the Apostle Paul man, kind of reiterating the same thing to the church at Galatia, that this ought not be a part of the believer's practice. But in fact, there's a more powerful truth that he lays out for us in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Now, there is a type of drunkenness we ought to practice, but look at it. It's found in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and we are looking together at verse 18. Let's look at it together. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. The Bible says, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation but be filled with the spirit. In fact, it's actually better rendered be drunk with the spirit. So friends, if you're going to be drunk with anything, you ought to be drunk with the spirit, intoxicated with the Holy Ghost, filled with the overflow, with the anointing of God. Now, there's somebody who's saying, Pastor, well, listen, I drink, but I don't get drunk. But see, the problem is some of us have a faulty standard for drunkenness. See, to be drunk doesn't mean that I'm vomiting, slurring, falling down, and blacking out and unable to walk. I need you to understand that drunkenness, it is simply speaking to an impaired ability to think, to comprehend. 
Whenever alcohol begins to impair your judgment, your words or your behaviors, whenever it begins to cause prohibitions or inhibitions to diminish where you do things and say things that you would not normally do, I need you to know that you are already in a state of drunkenness. And see, this is the question that I want to ask somebody, all right? Instead of asking, Pastor, why can't I drink or be drunk? The more important question is this. What is so painful about sober life that I feel like I have to escape reality and sober life through and through and through a chemical portal that allows me to escape the realities of the day? So sometimes when we ask the wrong questions, we get the wrong answers. So we ask, why can't I drink? But the more important question is what's so painful about sober life? What truth am I trying to hide from? What reality am I trying to escape? What disposition, man, am I trying to become numb to? And I need you to know, friends of mine, that if you allow Jesus Christ, man, to operate in your life and to fill the heart with joy, to strengthen you for adversity, guess what? You will literally begin to gain power over alcoholism and the addiction because what happens is you find your strength in God. You find your hope in God. God begins to amend your realities. He begins to bind up your wounds. And you don't live a life where you need alcohol to function as anesthesia to make you numb from the pain. Because what God does is he will bring about a healing of soul and a wholeness of mind that keeps you from having to run or escape from the realities of life. All right. And one of the things I want to just share with you is that when you look at the word, when you look at the scriptures, soberness is actually God's standard. Let's go over to first Peter. All right. I want you to look at a couple things in first Peter, first Peter, chapter one and verse 13, first Peter, chapter one and verse 13. Let's look at it in the word together. First Peter, chapter one and verse 13. This is God's standard. The Bible says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what the Bible is saying is that you've got to gird up the loins of your mind. Make sure that it is wrapped tightly, that you operate in soberness. One of the things that God wants to, you to do is to make sure that you have such a disposition of mind and spirit that you are not in an altered state that keeps you from being able to hear the voice of the spirit clearly that you causes you to miss abundant revelation that impairs your judgment and postures you to not be in position to recognize where God is moving in any given season. Let's go over a little further. First Peter chapter five and verse number seven. First Peter chapter five, actually, and we'll look together at verses seven and eight. First Peter chapter five, verses seven and eight. We'll look at the word together. The Bible says, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. But again, the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. The devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So again, we find that same principle at work in the word of the living God, where God is calling us to a standard of soberness, where we are to have clarity of mind clarity of thought, where we ought not be moved into a space where we are induced to think a certain way or act a certain way, where we have full capacity to be able to receive the things of God, digest the things of God and act on the things of God. In fact, there's a principle I do think that doesn't speak directly to alcohol, but I do think that there is a large principle at work. Go with me if you don't mind to second Timothy chapter one, and we're going to look together at verse number seven. Second Timothy chapter one, and we're going to look together at verse number seven. And, and I think this is very critical for us as we digest the word. First Timothy, second, first, second Timothy chapter one and verse seven. Watch this. The Bible says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. I'm hoping you catch that, that God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and love and a sound mind. Ooh, 
Coach Jesus has some serious strategy in his playbook, the Word of God. We're looking at alcohol today, and we encourage you to share this with a friend, coworker, or anyone you want to have a conversation with. Be sure to join us live on Fourth Fridays for What Just Happened. And bring your questions, not only from today's show, but the hot topics in the headlines. Exhale from BOL is every Friday. Make us part of your weekend routine. Now, let's get back to the playbook with Pastor Snell. All right, so if God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind, if anything that creates fear, if anything drives me away from having a sound mind, then it is not of God. Because friends of mine, one of the things that happens after a night of heavy drinking and revelry, when you first wake up, the first thing that is evoked is the spirit of fear, apprehension and anxiety about what I did, about what I said, about how I embarrassed myself, about how I compromised myself, my values and my witness. So one of the first things that accompanies, man, the alcoholic culture is the spirit of fear and anxiety about how my behaviors may have actually compromised my wellness, my wholeness, my professional life, or my spiritual well-being. And then number two, the other thing that alcohol does is it drives me out of a sound mind. I am not processing carefully. I am not processing appropriately. I am not walking in God's design. So I need you to know, friends of mine, that God calls us to a posture of soberness. And I need you to know that not only will he call you a posture to a posture of soberness, he'll bring about enough healing. He'll bring about enough wholeness and prosperity where you can handle a sober life without needing a chemical escape. All right. And this is my other apprehension and why I believe that man believers ought to operate in a spirit of soberness. Because one of the things that alcohol does, friends, is that if you're not careful, it will begin to take the place of God in your life. It will cease to just be a recreational activity. It will actually begin to take on an essential posture. And at a point, especially with alcohol addiction, see, there's a point where you drink alcohol just to get a buzz. There's a point where you drink alcohol just to get high. But then you reach a point where you drink alcohol just to feel normal because it becomes your soothing element. It becomes your comfort. It becomes your source. In fact, I want you to look with me because I need you to know that there is not supposed to be any substitute for God. Go with me to the Old Testament, Psalm 46. And I want you to look at verse number one, a very powerful promise in the word. Psalm the 46 division, our chapter. And we're going to look together at verse number one. Very powerful promise for us there in the word. Psalm 46 And verse number one, in fact, I know a number of us know the promise by heart. Let's look at it together. Psalm 46 and verse number one, 46 and verse one, the Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I need you to know that the word teaches that God is supposed to be our refuge, that God is our strength that God is the present help in the time of trouble. But one of the things that happens with alcohol culture is that it slowly begins to, begins to, 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 to engraft itself into our lives in such a way that when trouble comes, instead of turning to Jesus, we turn to Jack Daniels. Instead of turning to Jehovah, we turn to Michelob. And I need you to know that it becomes a substitute where we essentially look to these things first. And once all of those things wear off, once all of those things fail, then what happens is we eventually turn to God. And instead of making Jesus our first response, after a while, Jesus becomes our last resort. Because if you're not careful, it will replace the prayer place of prayer. It will replace the prayer place of the word. We will no longer find our hope and our joy in the Lord. We will eventually begin to find our hope and our joy in the bottle. In fact, I want you to go back with me to the book of Matthew. And I want you to look at one of the promises that God made. I want you to look in the book of Matthew chapter 11 
And I want you to look at one of the promises of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 22. Let's look in the word together. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 22. I want you to look at what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 11. Looking together, excuse me, at verse number 28. Look at the invitation Jesus says. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he goes on to say, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, friends of mine, what Jesus is saying is that when life overwhelms, when life gets heavy, when life gets too much for you to bear, God is saying, I don't want you to go to a substance. He's saying, I don't need you to go to your weed stash. I don't need you to pick up a pill or an opioid. I don't need you to pick up the bottle. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are laboring and are heavy laden. And he says, I will give you rest. In other words, friends of mine, what happens, and this is the most dangerous thing about weed culture, about alcohol culture, is that it poses as your help. It poses as a substitute for the joy, the transforming healing, the strength that only can be granted to us by Jesus Christ. It is a quick fix, but it does not change circumstances. It may allow you to escape the reality, but it does not change the reality. But the good news for the believer is that not only does God give you peace to abide in a difficult reality, not then God is able to change the reality. And what I'm saying to somebody today is I never want you to create a distorted tear of where your source is. I don't want you to let weed be number one and alcohol be number two and friends be number three and illicit sex be number four. And then essentially we look to God when all those other worldly substitutes fail. God is saying, I need you to make me the steering wheel, not the emergency brake. He's saying, I need you to make me the handlebars and not the helmet. God is saying, I need you to seek me first and my righteousness and all other things will be added unto you. And so friends of mine, I want to encourage you to make sure that you're moving away from a disposition of man. When it gets hard, let me just kick back with a cigarette. Let me just kick back with a drink. Man, let me just hit my little stash because I need you to know all it's doing is bringing woes and sorrows upon your life. And see, this is the thing about everything that brings a high. All right. Even psychologists teach us this, that whenever something gets you high fast, one of the things that follows every high is a low and a subtle form of depression. And one of the things that adds to depression is the practice of drinking alcohol. All right. It is something that impairs the mood in a consistent way. And that's why I want to espouse the people of God to not let this become a part of our steady diet, because whatever brings you high is going to eventually bring a low. But the good news is that when you're being built up in the Lord Jesus Christ and you get a natural high and you're getting drunk on the spirit, I need you to know it doesn't bring you back down but it keeps you on an escalating pace. And that's why the Bible says that the path of the just is like the shining sun. There is no dip or diminishment in it, but it grows brighter and brighter unto that glorious day. All right. Now, the other thing I need you to understand, and this is why you don't build a culture or a doctrine around one or two verses that seem to espouse the practice of drinking alcohol. So go with me to Mark chapter two. Mark chapter two, and there's a statement in the scripture that you actually see probably about 50 times in the Bible. And I don't think we realize what it means. Mark chapter two, and we're going to look together at verse number 22. Mark chapter two and verse number 22. All right. So, so Jesus says this, Matthew chapter, Mark chapter two and verse 22. He says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth uh, on an old garment or else the new piece pulls away and the old will tear away and be made worse. And he says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins 
or else the new wine will burst the wine skins. All right. So, so the term I just want you to bring into your vernacular is the term new wine. All right. In fact, you see that term also in Proverbs 23. You see it in the book of Hosea. You see it in the book of Lamentations. You see it in the book of Nehemiah, where, where that term new wine is actually simply a reference to grape juice. All right. So there are times where the word grape juice and wine are actually used interchangeably. So there are times where the Bible references wine and it is simply a reference to grape juice or unfermented drink, unfermented drink. So let me give you an example of that. Go to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. We're going to look together at verse 31. And I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Proverbs chapter 23. And we're going to look together at verse number 31. 31. All right. And I hope this helps somebody. All right. So that you understand kind of some of the cultural nuances of scripture. Proverbs 23 and verse 31. So the Bible says, look not on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup. When it swirls around smoothly, at last it bites like a serpent and it stings like a viper. So notice what it says. It says, don't look at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. Now, again, I need you to understand that, especially in ancient times, when, when you were making grape juice, when it was unfermented, it would have a deep purple color just like it does when you bring it to your house. But so the Bible says, make it, it makes it very clear that when it's unfermented, it has this deep purple color. But notice what the word says. It says, don't even look at the wine when it is red. Once it goes from having that deep pur purple color to a reddish color, because what it's describing is that that drink has gone through the process of fermentation. Let me show it to you again. So it's don't look at it when it is red. When it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly, what the Bible is describing is once that drink's color has changed, once its texture has changed, now it has a sparkling, bubbling element to it. Now it goes down with a different type of texture or taste. The Bible says don't even look at it once it's gone through the process of fermentation. Because in the end, it's going to bite like a serpent. It's going to sting like an adder. It's going to have consequences that are harsh, that are going to be lasting, that are not going to be the type of results that you would covet or want under circumstances where you would normally be sober. So you need to be mindful when you say, well, the Bible promotes the presence of wine or the drinking of wine. You need to realize that many times, especially in an ancient culture, Wine and grape juice, those terms at certain places in the scripture were used interchangeably. So a lot of times the primary term you see in scripture is actually the term new wine, which is a reference to newly uh, uh, harnessed or pressed juice that comes from the fruit of the grape. And then there are times where wine and grape juice is used interchangeably. And this is an example. So the Bible refers to it as wine, but it says once it's gone through the process of fermentation, you need to be very leery and cautious of it. All right. Then the last thing I want to really say about drinking alcohol is what it does to our decision making process. So so let's go a couple places. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number one. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number one. Proverbs 20 and verse number one. So now what we're looking at is what we look before is what the Bible describes. But what we're looking at now are principles about what the Bible actually prescribes. Proverbs 20 verse one, the Bible says wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. All right. So the Bible makes it clear that these particular elements have deceptive property, uh, deceptive principles and and, and, and premonitions to it. And the Bible says that when I allow myself to be under its rule, its tutorship or its direction, the Bible says that this is not wisdom for me as a believer. Now, let's go back to Proverbs 23, where we just looked at before, because again, I need you to know that it impacts our decisions in a tremendous way. Proverbs 23. And we're going to look together at verse number 29. Check this out. I mean, this is wisdom for the body of Christ. 
Proverbs 23 and verse number 29. Look at what the scripture says. It says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Because we're under the apprehension that drinking is going to better our life. It's going to make our lives more impactful, more joyful, more free, more loose. But look at how the Bible describes it. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine and those who go in search of mixed wine. Then he says, do not look at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At last, it bites like a serpent. And it stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like the one who lies at the top of the mass saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I await that I may seek another drink? In other words, the Bible is making very, very clear. That if you want your life to be filled with sorrow, with woe, with complaints, with unnecessary wounds, the Bible says all I've got to do is look at the wine after it's been transformed or spend too much time at the wine press. The Bible makes it clear that it's going to compromise my power of observation. Bible says I'm going to see strange things. And then the Bible says, I'm going to make perverse speech. All right. Then the Bible says it's going to create all these woes and all these sorrows. But because it has this addictive element to it, the Bible makes it clear that after I've suffered all of these consequences in verse number 35, it says, man, when, sh when did I awake? When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? In other words, it has such an addictive property to it that I'm willing to pursue it to seek after it and search for it, even though it's bringing a multitude of sorrows and suffering to my life. And so friends of mine, I need you to ask yourself the question, does it help? Does it edify? And let me just talk from my own experience. I need you to know, man, that I have a number of stresses. I have a number, man, of things that bring anxiety and vexation to my soul. I have bills. There are at times medical uh, 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 issues. Man, I have a high stress job and I, a lot of demands. But one of the things I can just say to you today, friends of mine, and I'm not saying that you got to do it like I do it, but I need you to know that I've been fortunate to be able to say that my help is in the Lord that I am not made joyful by anything that is chemical. I don't find my strength in anything that is created in a test tube. I need somebody to know that my help cometh from the Lord, the Lord who makes heaven and earth. And, and see, this is the thing I want to say to somebody, because we look at how, man, drinking impacts judgment and decisions. I want to say this to somebody, and this is why somebody should never drink. If you make bad decisions sober, <laughs> if you make bad decisions when you don't have anything in you, then you should never put anything in you. If you make bad decisions sober, then you should never pick up, man, a Hennessy, a Black and Mild, man, a Michelob or a Corona, man, or an Alizé, man, or, or, or a Rosé. Like if you make bad decisions unintoxicated, man, certainly you don't need any help being stupid. You don't make, need any assistance being foolish. You don't need any aid making bad decisions. Let me say it again. If you make bad financial choices, sober. If you choose the wrong people when you're in your right mind. If you say the wrong things, man, when you're in your right train of thought, then guess what? You should never be out of your mind because those bad decisions you make sober are multiplied times 10 when you got the wrong things operating in you and having control of the will. So I can't say to you in theological truth that the Bible condemns the use of wine or drinking completely. But I think, friends, that when we look at the actual principles and what it is prescribing, I think the conclusion that we ought to settle on 
is that in order for me to be sober, in order to make sure I have no substitute for God, that I am at peak capacity to receive all of the revelations and promptings of the Holy Spirit, I made a decision to remove that from my diet so that I can lean completely on the arms and the help that comes from God. And so I'm praying today that this helps you, that it allows the matter to be settled for somebody and that you prayerfully make some decisions as believers about what you need to amend or how you want to continue to abide in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today, friends, I just want to remind you that as we spend this time here in the playbook, that the playbook is not a debate space. It's not an opinion space. It's where we allow the word of God to be the arbiter in all disputes. We allow the principle of the scripture to settle things in our heart. So we thank you so much for joining us this weekend at The Exhale with BOL. I look forward to seeing you again. And whenever you get confused, when you need direction, when you need to know which way to go, just remember that the Bible is your playbook. Thank you for watching The Playbook. The Weekend Exhale with BOL is every Friday night at 8 p.m. Central Time. Join us for honest discussion, relevant topics, and practical advice. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single episode. Your support keeps the mission of Breath of Life moving forward. There are ways both on screen and in the description that you can give. Catch up on some of the episodes that you may have missed by clicking on one of the playlists right here. <laughs>